Today we're talking about chapter five. We're doing op amps and usually I can get through this whole chapter in one video unlike chapter four. So we move pretty quickly through chapter five for a lot of reasons. One is you're going to see op amps again. So we kind of give you a taste of operational amplifiers and then um, we leave it to, we have entire classes dedicated basically to op amps and op amp analysis. So you'll get to those later on. We try not to belabor it too much. These are, this is a fun chapter though. I like chapter five. I like teaching it. I think students like it because it's a little bit of a break. It is a little bit different. So our analysis is going to sort of everything we've told you, you need to do everything we've told you, you know, you need to be strict about. We start to get a little bit loose with it in chapter five and it's okay. The, pro the good thing is it's a process that you can follow. It should be noted though, the process we teach you for analyzing op amps only works for the relatively limited selection of op amps or op amp configurations we talk about. There's a lot of advanced op amp circuits that have positive feedback and, um, and other sort of more complicated feedback mechanisms where your analysis has to be a more traditional analysis, something like we did in chapter four. The method we go over in this chapter though, works just fine for the types of simple circuits we deal with in this class. So before we talk about op amps, what's an amplifier? Well, an amplifier is a new circuit symbol. So this is exciting. We've talked about resistors, voltage supplies, current supplies, but there's not much to it. So an amplifier is basically just stuff you've already seen, namely dependent supplies that are all wrapped into a multi-terminal circuit element. So the idea here is with this sort of op amplifier design, typically you have some input Vn relative to some unshown reference here and some output V out again relative to some unseen reference over here and an amplifier just amplifies this input voltage so if this were a gain of 10 amplifier and this input voltage here was one volt your output here would be 10 volts fairly straightforward a basic amplifier design uh, there's also a differential amplifier so this amplifier rather than having a single input voltage relative to a common reference a differential amplifier has a two input and it looks at the difference in electrical potential between those inputs. So in this case, if for instance, we had if we had nine volts here and we had ten volts here and this was a gain of 10 amplifier. In this case, even though we have 10 volts at this terminal, we have nine volts here. So this is gonna take the difference between those two and multiply it by 10. So it's gonna take 10 volts minus nine volts, which is one volt difference here, multiply it by 10 and give you an output of 10 volts. So that's the difference between a single ended input amplifier and a differential input amplifier. Well, both of these are not the types of amplifiers we're gonna be talking about in this class. In this class, we're gonna talk about a special type of amplifier called an operational amplifier. An operational amplifier is a type of differential input amplifier, but it's got a unique property and that is that its gain is infinite. So this is an amplifier where it takes the voltage difference between those terminals and it multiplies it by infinity and that's the output voltage. Well, you should immediately realize that we don't deal with infinities much in this class and certainly in the real world, you're not gonna find a voltage supply that outputs infinity volts. So what does this mean? What does this mean to have a gain of infinity? Well, basically what this means is that these types of amplifiers, these operational amplifiers, always are gonna operate in such a way that there is some feedback path from the output to the negative terminal such that this amplifier keeps this difference between these terminals at zero volts. So, so this amp, this op amp design and op amp in general only works in meaningful, useful ways when it has some feedback path to the negative terminal. What that means is essentially that if you, if you, with these amplifiers, if you ever start to get even a little tiny voltage buildup, a little tiny potential difference between these terminals, this output is going to drastically ramp up its voltage and that's going to pull, that's going to increase the voltage of the negative terminal such that it corrects that difference. So it corrects that input differential. So operational amplifiers do work with finite voltages. We're not working with infinity voltages in our circuits or our analysis of the circuits. We're working with five volts, 10 volts, two volts, eight volts, whatever these normal 
you know, non, you know, these finite values of voltage. And so you can pretty much tell that these op amp circuit analysis become kind of a zero times infinity sort of analysis problems. And you learned if you took, you know, limits, a class on limits. I don't know where, where they teach that in math curriculum. When I, when I took it, it was sort of in a pre-calc class. We did these sort of limit analysis. But, but what is zero times infinity? One of the quick things you learn is it depends on what flavor of zero you're working with and it depends on what flavor of infinity you're working with, right? Zero times infinity could be zero. It could be infinity. It could be seven. It could be 12. It could even be five. Um, but you don't really know, right? It's a, uh, but, but, what we do in this class is we basically, instead of going through the pure mathematics of it, of we have these uh, ratios that are infinite in nature and we can't cancel out numerators and denominators till we get some, some either a limit that goes to zero or to infinity or to some finite value. Rather than doing that, we sort of assume the case that this amplifier is operating with a zero volt differential across its terminals. And we find what finite output value would be required for that to be the case. So our analysis skips that sort of more complex mathematical analysis. And instead it just sort of goes with just kind of a circuit, a straightforward circuit analysis. But it does assume this, this our gain of infinity amplifier is operating with a, it's doing a zero times infinity equals question marks. And, and we're just gonna, we just find what that, question mark is. We find what that output value has to be in order to have the zero volt difference across the terminal. But again, for this to happen, we have to have negative feedback, meaning the output of the op amp has to increase the voltage on the negative terminal. That way it can correct an imbalance. If you start to get a little imbalance on the input, that output change of the op amp of this amplifier will, will resolve that. If, if you have positive feedback, then if you start to get a little voltage difference across the inputs, the output's going to make it worse. It's going gonna, it's gonna to increase the potential on the positive terminal, and that's going to make the difference bigger, and that's going to then it's all just going to blow up to infinity. Okay. If, if this is starting to not make sense to you, I totally understand that, and this is a case where examples will help sort of clear it up. So hang on for now. If, it's, if, you're start, if I'm starting to lose you, hold on, and, and we'll get to some examples, and it'll probably be fine. Okay, so as stated earlier, op amps, this gain of infinity basically means there has to be some feedback to keep everything from blowing up to infinity. And the feedback has to be from the output to the negative terminal. And because it has to be the negative terminal, we typically flip the op amp. So on the previous slide, I had positive on top, negative on bottom. That's typical for an amplifier circuit. But now we're flipping it. We're putting the negative on top. Why are we doing that? Because that way our feedback whatever circuit we have in here for our feedback, all of this exists above the amp when we draw this. Why do we want it to be above the amp? It's just a human thing. It's a weird human thing. It's like having the zero volt voltage reference on the bottom of your circuit. We like to put the zero volt reference on the bottom. I don't know why. It's just, we just like thinking about it. I like thinking about it on the bottom. I like, I don't know why, some weird thing. But, but with op amps, we like to have our feedback circuit which a lot of times is kind of the, the nuts and bolts of the operation of this amplifier. We like to put that on top of the amplifier. And to do that, we have to flip the op amp so this negative terminal is on top. Okay. And we analyze these op amp circuits always assuming the op amp is working properly. The op amp working properly means the op amp has not blown up to infinity and it is providing negative feedback and that negative feedback is keeping this voltage difference at the input terminals right at zero. And this is not always the case. Sometimes a circuit is configured in such a way that this is not true. And when that happens, uh, we usually just solve and then we check afterwards. So after we find our solution, we see whether or not that solution was possible. And if it wasn't, then we say, yeah, something might be a little wrong with the way this circuit was configured. But we start, when we start by analyzing these op-amp circuits, we assume they're wired in such a way that everything will work out okay. Okay, so what are our simplifying assumptions? The simplifying assumption for an op amp circuit is one we already talked about, which is that this voltage difference between these terminals is zero volts. So an op amp is always operating in this zero times infinity type of situation. Another simplifying assumption we have is that the current flowing into these terminals is zero. So we assume that 
this operational amplifier is is feeling this voltage difference between the terminals. It's 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 sensing the voltage difference, but it's not actually drawing a current to do that. And this is, believe it or not, a fairly good assumption. A lot of a lot of op amps that are made nowadays, some of them have extremely low input currents. Some of them have input currents on the order of femtoamps. So femto, a femtoamp being 10 to the minus 15th amps. Um, so very generally, actually, the current flowing in being zero is pretty good. It's not always the case. Different op amps are different, but but this is probably a better assumption than the gain of infinity assumption, actually. So, okay, so zero volt difference across the input terminals and no current flowing into the input terminals. And so zero volt difference across the terminals also means the voltage of the positive terminal equals the voltage of the negative terminal. And then lastly, what do we do? Um, sorry, the process we follow is assuming all of these simplifying assumptions. We then, using these simplifying assumptions, find the current flowing towards the negative terminal. And we'll talk about what that means in a little bit. Once we find the current flowing towards the negative terminal, that is the current that travels through the feedback loop. And we use that to find the feedback voltage drop. And then we use the feedback voltage drop and the voltage at the negative terminal to find the output voltage. Again, I like to say it, I like to say the process and we're gonna, I'm gonna tell you this process over and over and over again in this, in this slideshow, but it doesn't make a whole lot of sense till we do it. So let's do it. Let's analyze an op amp. Now, one of the things in this chapter is we do a lot of analysis of circuits that don't have actual real numerical values. We just use variables, resistor value RS, resistor value RF, input voltage VS. And we like doing this with variables because it gives us these equations that are sort of generic mathematical equations that if we ever see the circuit configuration again, rather than having to resolve the system, we can just plug values into this equation that we derived. So let's, and now some students like that, some students dislike that. Some students would really just prefer we just use numbers like five and 10K and 20K. And we will do that a little bit, but for now, for describing these op amp circuits, we're just gonna do the general case and look at these sort of general circuit solutions. Okay, um, so this is, this circuit, I kind of give it away here by saying it's the inverting amplifier circuit. But what we're gonna do is we're gonna follow our op amp analysis procedure for the first time here to find this, an equation for this output voltage for this circuit. Okay, first thing we do is draw the simplifying assumptions. I always, always, even now, always actually draw these simplifying assumptions on my circuit. So the first one is that there is zero volt difference between these terminals. Uh, the next simplifying assumption is that this current is zero and this current is zero. So there is no current flowing into these terminals. Our next process is one, find the voltage at the positive terminal. So the voltage of the positive terminal in this case, the positive terminal is connected to ground. So the voltage of the positive terminal in this case is easy at zero. What if it wasn't zero? We could have put, we could have had any circuit connected to the positive terminal we want. We could have had the most complex circuit you ever saw in chapter four connected to the positive terminal. And your first step would simply be to solve for the voltage of the positive terminal. So analyze that circuit however you have to, find that voltage of the positive terminal, find an expression for it. That's step one after drawing your simplifying assumptions. All right, it was easy here. In this case, the voltage of the positive terminal was zero. And the nice thing is we know that means that the voltage of the negative terminal here is also zero volts. Now, again, this is where we're sort of working our way back. We're saying we're assuming this op amp is working properly. Working properly meaning this op amp is outputting whatever voltage is necessary to keep the voltage difference of these input terminals zero. So assuming that's true, then the voltage at the positive terminal will be the voltage of the negative terminal, which will be zero in this case. The next step is, oops, find the current flowing towards the negative terminal. So in this case, the current flowing towards the negative terminal would be this IS here. Now IS, it is going to be the voltage on this side of the resistor minus the voltage on this side divided by RS. What's the voltage on this side? It's VS. What's the voltage on this side? It's the voltage of the negative terminal VN, but we already know what that is. That's zero volts. So it's VS minus zero divided by RS. 
And this is where it starts to bother some people that it feels like we're playing a little fast and loose. We're just kind of, we're sort of chop, we're sort of doing this sort of strange hybrid version of kind of a node voltage analysis that we did in chapter four. You, we, can, you, we can still use all those circuit techniques that we used in chapter four. And we're still kind of using them here. We're just doing it in a specific piece by piece process. So we can still analyze this the same with using all those techniques. op amp circuits are still linear systems. So superposition still works as well. Um, but we're gonna kind of, we're just gonna follow it in a slightly more, uh, slightly more sort of uh, abbreviated approach to, to finding the unknowns in this system. Okay, so this current IS is VS over R. Sorry, VS over RS. And um, now the interesting thing is this current flow here, uh, we have a branch here, right? We have some current flowing into here IN and some current flowing this way. But remember, our simplifying assumption was that this current flowing into the negative terminal was zero. So that means that whatever current was flowing here also has to be the same as the current flowing here. And that's very important. So whatever current was flowing towards the negative terminal is going to be the same current that's flowing through the feedback resistor in this direction. But the current flowing in this direction is the opposite of this feedback current as labeled here. Ultimately, it doesn't really matter as long as we're careful with how we draw the voltage drop across that feedback resistor, it'll work out either way. But sometimes people like to write basically, sometimes people like to write that I F equals negative I S, which would be negative V S over R S. So we can either look at the current flowing this way and call it the feedback current, or we can just continue to say this current flowing towards the negative terminal. Well, this current flowing towards the negative terminal just keeps on working its way here because there can be no current flow in the into that negative terminal at the op amp. All right, either, either way is fine. The nice thing is though, if we use IF, if we use IF, which is the current flowing in this direction, then using V equals IR gives us the voltage drop like this. So we'll, we'll call that VFB for the feedback voltage. So the feedback voltage here is going to be IF times RF, that's going to be negative VS over RS times RF. So now what's this output voltage? This output voltage is going to be the voltage of this node plus VFB. So V out equals VN plus VFB but we know the voltage of the negative terminal is zero. So this is gonna be zero plus negative Vs times Rf over Rs. And that zero doesn't matter, right? So we have V out equals negative Vs times Rf over Rs. And another way, just to clean this up a little bit, another, maybe it makes it a little more clear here, we can say, V out equals Vs, which is our input, times negative Rf over Rs. So what this circuit has done is this circuit has taken this input voltage Vs and it has multiplied it by this negative ratio. Now that's very nice. So redrawing it on the next circuit, which maybe I should have remembered that I'd done that. Uh, this is a very interesting what we've done here. We, so we have a, we've taken our input and we've multiplied it by this constant. It's a negative constant, but we have multiplied it by this constant that is defined by the ratio of these resistances. And that's a very powerful tool. It basically allows us to take a voltage value, multiply it by some programmable value where all we have to do is choose a ratio of resistors and we can you know, multiply this input by anything from negative zero to negative infinity. Okay, and also one thing to note, in this class, we only work with DC values. We only work with sort of constant, with sort of stable constant voltage and current supplies, but VS can be anything. So VS doesn't have to be some constant value five. It could be a, a value that's wiggling up and down. 
this algebraic equation stays the same. So even if Vs were some function of time, this is like an audio signal or something like that, this would still hold. We'd still be multiplying that signal by this negative multiple between zero and negative infinity. Let's look at another configuration of all. Actually, before we look at the other configuration, I wanna quickly go over something. One of the things that bothers students when we analyze op amps is they feel like the op amp is doing nothing. Right? When we did this analysis, we just say, oh, everything's zero and the currents are zero. And so here's the output. The output is some voltage value. And it, that really drives students nuts sometimes where they say, you know, okay, if everything's zero, what's, what is this amplifier doing? Keep in mind, this amplifier is what allows these to be zero. The amplifier is outputting the voltage necessary for this voltage difference to be zero. So it's not that the amplifier isn't doing anything, it's we assume the amplifier is doing whatever it needed to do to keep this voltage difference zero. And what we're doing is we're going backwards and saying, okay, assuming it was keeping this voltage difference zero, what voltage was it outputting in order to do that? So the amplifier is still doing a very important job here. Let's look at a different circuit. One thing to notice now, now we're sort of showing these voltages rather than drawing a supply here, and labeling it VA, we're just showing these input voltages VA, VB, and VC as just a, just a positive negative polarity sign here. So let's analyze this circuit, same way we did before. One, find the voltage at the positive terminal. Well, once again, our positive terminal is grounded. So that equals zero, and that is equal to the voltage of the negative terminal. So we know, oh boy, I jumped too fast. We got to write these simplifying assumptions. No current flow and no voltage difference. Okay. So voltage of the negative terminal, oh, sorry, voltage of the positive terminal is zero, which means the voltage of the negative terminal is also zero. So we got a big zero volts here. And so two. Step three is find the current flowing towards the negative terminal. So the current flowing towards the negative terminal, in this case, it's interesting. We have three currents. And the combination of these three currents is gonna be this current flowing towards the negative terminal. So let's solve for these currents, solve for these three currents. So what's this first current up here? Well, this current is gonna be the voltage on this side of the resistor minus the voltage on this side. The voltage on this side was zero. So it's gonna be VA divided by RA. This current is going to be VB divided by RB. And this current is going to be VC divided by RC. So the total current flowing out of this junction here is going to be VA over RA plus VB over RB plus VC over RC. And it's also interesting to note, we could have had seven more of these if we wanted to. We could have had seven more of these input voltages in series with the resistor, and we would have just kept adding on to these input expressions. So this current flowing towards the negative terminal is the sum of these currents through these input resistors. And now this current flowing towards the negative terminal, the feedback current, is going to be the negative of that. So IF equals negative I. That's going to be negative one times interesting. Okay. And um, now what is our v VFB? Our feedback voltage. It's gonna be RF times IF. That's gonna be negative RF times VA over RA plus VB over RB plus VC over RC. Hmm. So what's our output voltage? Well, our output voltage is gonna be the voltage of this node plus this feedback voltage. So zero plus 
VFB equals VFB equals this. So my our output voltage is this negative RF times this ratio VA over RA plus VB over RB plus VC over RC. Another way to write this is So what we have here is we have this output voltage is the negative of this ratio times the input VA plus this ratio times the input VB plus this ratio times the input VC. So each one of these input voltages is each being scaled by this ratio RF over RA, RB, RC. And then those are all being added together. So this is called the summing amplifier specifically because of that. We are adding these input voltages together. We're taking each one of these input voltages. We are essentially multiplying it by some uh, ratio of resistors, and then we're adding those values together. And we can create this ratio of resistors by changing. We can tune this, this, um, this coefficient here by tuning the value of these resistors. This is very, very, very powerful. So essentially what we've created here is this circuit can take multiple inputs, as many inputs as we want. And by simply changing a resistor value, we can change how much we're multiplying that input signal by. And then we can add a bunch of these input signals together. If you've ever seen an audio mixer, an audio mixer is, you'll see kind of, it's got a whole bunch of different audio sources coming in. It's got one or more audio sources coming out. And it combines those input audio sources together. And typically, there's a volume for each one of those inputs that's usually a little slider knob on a board. That circuit, that audio mixer circuit, is basically just this circuit here, where those sliders that are on the board are these resistors. So they're a little, little linear potentiometer, which is a resistance value that can change based on sliding this thing back and forth. And all of the, all that's required to combine those audio signals together is a single amplifier. This is really incredible. I mean, that you can take, you could have 30 different input signals that are all added together using a single amplifier. It's, I mean, it's really powerful. And this is the reason why it's very hard within the EE lab to keep operational amplifiers in stock, because students, these are so useful, students tend to, they tend to walk off or they're used for projects. And it's okay to use them for projects, but don't, don't sell them on eBay, please. So, <laughs> so, um, so very powerful. And that, and that brings us back to, I wanna talk about why these are called operational amplifiers. So these are called operational amplifiers uh, because they can do these kinds of mathematical operations. So we talked about the previous amplifier circuit could multiply an input voltage by a number between zero and negative infinity. And this circuit can take input values, scale them by a ratio of resistances, and then add them together. So this is performing ad the op addition operation. The previous circuit was performing sort of multiplication by a negative uh, multiple. And for a long time, historically, these types of circuits were literally used to do mathematical operations. So if, you know, before we had very fast digital systems that could do complex mathematical operations quickly, people would literally use these op amp circuits in order to build a mathematical equation where the input would be a voltage or current value and the op amp would do these mathematical operations faster than they could be done with a digital computing system. So, so that's the origin of the name operational in that sense. Uh, that's how they were used. And if you look at a lot of math departments, um, or a lot of math departments around the country, they still have some of these really impressive old um, circuit boards that had dozens or hundreds of operational amplifiers on them that were doing these complex mathematical equations. So they would build these circuits that would do these very advanced math functions and just really impressive stuff. So we only have two mathematical functions. We got to spend a little more time building up some some mathematical operations that we can do here oh yeah 
But before that, there might be something that's bothering you a little bit. One of the things that might be bothering you is, we've said these op amps have no current flowing into these terminals. Does that mean there's no current flowing out? Well, no, there has to be a current flowing out. Basically, these op amps have to provide whatever current is necessary to, to get the proper output voltage in order to in order to keep the input terminals at a zero volt difference. So if there's no current flowing into the inputs and there is current flowing out of the outputs, how does that not violate Kirchhoff's current law? Well, there's extra stuff that I've been hiding from you this whole lecture, and that is the supply rails. So operational amplifiers are all powered by supply, supply rails. We have a positive rail and a negative rail. And the most important thing to know about these rails is these rail voltages that power your op amp, these set the limit for the range of output voltages that your op amp is capable of producing. So if you power an op amp with plus 10 and minus 10 volts, there's no way for this output voltage to go beyond that. You'd never be able to output 15 volts with this op amp. And so a lot of times what people what we'll do is when we analyze an op amp circuit, we will ignore the power rails in our initial analysis we'll solve for our output voltage and then we'll check if that output voltage isn't within the range of power supplies of supply voltages for this op amp then we'll say well actually there was no way for this to be the actual output voltage and we'll have to say in reality this output voltage was limited at this upper or lower rail so it was really something other than the ideal case and we have to go back and sort of reanalyze the circuit after that so so an op amp is not capable of outputting a voltage beyond its power supply rails, but op amps that can go to the rails, op amps that can output a voltage that's close to their rails, these are special op amps typically called rail to rail op amps. Most op amps can't even go close to, sorry, to their supply rails. So most op amps, if you power them with plus or minus 10 volts, they can maybe output plus or minus nine volts if they're, if they're decent. Some of them may maybe only plus or minus eight volts. So, this is often what's called a supply offset or supply drop or a supply dropout. It's basically referring to how close the op amp's output can get to its rails. If the op amp's output can get very close to its rails, we call it a rail to rail op amp. If it's not, we just have to specify how close it can get. What that, what's that supply uh, drop or that supply uh, offset or that supply dropout? And this is the, the, range, the full range of output voltages that an op amp is capable of is sometimes called the output swing. So the swing is the term we often use to, to describe the, the full range of, of output voltages that are capable is sort of what's the swing, you know, does it have a rail to rail output swing? Is it, is it able to swing within one volt of its rails? Is it able to swing within 0 0.7 volts of its rails, et cetera? These are kind of how we describe op amps. So, um, not too important now. The, the, the supply rails aren't too important as long as you keep in mind that's where the current's coming from. And as long as you also keep in mind that an op amp, its output can never exceed those rail voltage values. Okay. Uh, let's go, let's, let's, let's do an actual problem with actual numbers here. So, so analyzing a circuit with the summing amplifier, which we just did with actual numbers. So we can analyze this. Well, we already know the equation for this, so we can just use the equation for this, basically. Um, but let's do some actual numbers here. Let, well, let's start analyzing this from scratch with the actual numbers. So this one we say VA is 0.1 and VB is 0.2. So analyzing this zero volt drop, no current. And we're gonna say, uh, um, that means voltage of the positive terminal is zero. So the voltage of the negative terminal is zero. So we got oh, zero volts here. So then this current is going to be, uh, this current here, we'll just call it IA. This current here, we'll call it IB. So IA is going to be um, VA, which is 0 0.1 minus zero divided by 5K. IB is gonna be VB, which is 0 0.2 minus zero divided by 25K.
So we have uh, 20 microamps here. And this one is eight microamps. So that's a, that's a micro, that's a mu, not a milli, not an M. So then our total current flowing towards the negative terminal is gonna be 20 microamps plus eight microamps. 28 microamps, which means our feedback current, IFB, is going to be negative I, that's going to be negative 28 microamps. So then just jumping somewhere else on the page, that means our feedback voltage is going to be 250K times negative 28 uh, times negative 28 microamps. That equals negative seven volts. And V out is gonna equal zero plus that. So our output voltage is negative seven volts here. Um, and we could have found that just by plugging in this into the equation. So if we went back to the original equation that we had, now this one was for three, but we can just cut it off and just make two out of it. So the equation that we had said that, I should clean this up. If we hadn't gone through the math, we just used the original equation. We could say V out equals negative um, 250K over 5K times 0 0.1 plus 250K divided by 25K times 0 0.2. is five plus two. So negative five plus two equals negative seven volts. Boom. So found it that way too. Okay. So let's do this again now. Let's say we had, let's do this now with VA is equal to 0.2 and VB is equal to 0.8. Make myself a little room here. So let's replace this with a 0.2 and this with a 0.8. So now we have a negative, sorry, we have a 10 plus eight. So that's negative 18 volts. Okay, so now we say our output voltage is negative 18 volts. But in this case, we had this thing powered by 15 volt and a negative 10 volt supply. So there's no way it could output negative 18 volts. And in actuality, it has to be outputting negative 10 volts. So essentially this op amp is gonna hit that negative rail. It's not able to go past that negative rail. So it's gonna max out at the negative rail value. And what if we wanted to go back and analyze the system? Well, we can still, if, if, if we know we have negative 10 volts here, the rest of this circuit all still holds true. We still have no current flow here. So essentially we could analyze this as just a
we could still analyze it just like a circuit looks like that. I'm not going to go through the process, but if we did want to know these other features, if we want to know how messed up everything was because this circuit wasn't able to get past its negative rail, it's an easy thing to do. We can analyze it the way we would any circuit that we had seen in chapter four. Okay, so that's railing. Let's go. More, more op-amp circuits. The non-inverting amplifier. We're just going to get through as many of these as we can. Now, this is interesting because now we don't have zero. So far, all, we've always had zero volts of the positive terminal. Now we have something other than zero volts. So, so first of all, we're going to draw, before we get too far, we're going to draw these currents. No current, no voltage difference here. Zero volt difference. So what's the voltage of the positive terminal here? Well, there's this pesky resistor RS here. But what does that resistor do? Think to yourself, don't wait for me to say it. What does that resistor RS do? Here's a hint, there's no current flowing through it. Right? Our simplifying assumption is there's no current flowing into this positive terminal. So if there's no current flowing in, there's no voltage drop across, there's no current through RS, which means there's no voltage drop across RS. So RS is meaningless, doesn't do anything. So the voltage of the positive terminal in this case, oops. It's just that VG input, which means the voltage of the negative terminal is VG. So we have VG volts here. So now our question is, what's our current flowing towards the negative terminal? Well, I'm going to flip things around here and I'm going to say, rather than finding the current flowing towards the negative terminal and then taking the negative of that to find the feedback current, Let's just right off the bat find the current flow in the other direction. And there's a reason I want to just find the current flow in the other direction right now. So the current flowing this way is going to be, what's the voltage on this side? It's VG. What's the voltage on this side? It's zero. So the current flow in the other way, which is the feedback current, is going to be VG minus zero divided by RS. So that is, right? Because there's no current flow here. There's no current flow here. So this current flow in here has got to be the same as this current flow in here. So now what's our feedback voltage? Our feedback voltage is going to be RF times that current. But now something's a little different here. So now our output voltage, what is that? That's the voltage of the negative terminal plus the feedback voltage. But in this case, the voltage of the negative terminal is not zero. It's VG. So it's VG plus VG times RF over RS which equals VG times one plus RF over RS. So this is cool. So this is basically saying our output voltage is our input voltage times, uh, why am I right? Why am I writing so much? I'm just messing, I had a perfectly good equation, right? So it means our, it means our output voltage is v, our input VG times this coefficient. This coefficient is one plus the ratio RF over RS. So the cool thing about this is we're not multiplying by a negative number. The previous circuits, we had all had this sort of output is some negative something times the input. In this case, it's not. In this case, the output is a positive something times the input. But what's the downside of this circuit? We can never multiply this input VG by anything less than one. So this is, so the range, the, the range of gains for this circuit is one to infinity. Whereas for the inverting amplifier, we were, we were zero to negative infinity. For the inverting amplifier, for the non-inverting amplifier, our range of gain is one to infinity. So we can't have a gain of less than one. But people still find ways to build these circuits with a gain of less than one. And one easy way to do it is put a voltage divider in here create a voltage divider on the input. And then that voltage divider can be used to reduce the input voltage. And then, you know, you have a gain of, of one or greater. 
So, so people still use this to have a gain of less than one. And just to note, that's called attenuating. If you have a gain of less than one, that's typically called attenuating. It means you're taking, you're, you're reducing the magnitude of your signal. And a gain of greater than one is typically considered amplifying. Technically, attenuating is a type of amplifying, but in sort of casual terminology, amplifying would be gains of one or greater. And attenuating would be gains of less than one. All right, let's do one more and then we're gonna call it, we're, we're gonna kind of do one more example and then you'll have plenty of examples to do on the homework. But this is gonna be the last example um, that we look at in terms of analyzing op-amp circuits for chapter five. These are the big ones. So, so far, what have we done? We've done multiplying by a negative number. We've done addition. We've done multiplying by a positive number. What, what would we like to do? If you say an integral, then I'm gonna smack the computer screen. No, <laughs> we actually, you can do integrals very easily with op-amps. All you need is a capacitor. So you can, you can do integrals and derivatives very easily with op-amps. It's actually really cool, uh, but it's beyond this class. But um, what's left? Subtraction. We'd really like to be able to do subtraction. So that's, you know, I'm giving away, when I do these on a board, I don't usually give the name, but you got to title the slide with something. So I kind of give away the secrets here as I'm going through this process. This is by far the, the ugliest math of all the analysis that we've done here. Um, but let's jump right into it. The good thing is it's a process and that process starts by writing the simplifying assumptions. No current, no voltage drop. What's the voltage of the positive terminal? Well, we actually got something going on now. So now we have VB, but VB is we got a little voltage divider here. So the voltage of the positive terminal based on the voltage divider equation is gonna be VB times RD over RD plus RC. All righty. And then that voltage of the positive terminal, assuming our op amp is working correctly, that is the voltage of the negative terminal. So the voltage of the negative terminal equals, I don't wanna rewrite it it's sloppy enough already. It's never better the second time around. So the, that, that is the voltage of the negative terminal. So this, this voltage here is this ugly VB times RD over RD plus RC. Man, actually that was nicer. That was, my handwriting is atrocious and that's actually a little bit better. And I was writing it smaller too. What's going on? I think it's the difference between if my hand is sort of pressed against the screen or if my hand is floating, but I apologize. Your, your eyesight's gonna get really good at looking at slop by the end of this class. You're gonna be, you're gonna be able to just see right through my atro atrocious chicken scratch here. I should have been a doctor, my handwriting's so bad. I would have had the best doctor's signature. Okay, let's keep going. We got more work to do. So we know the voltage of the negative terminal, it's VB times RD over RD plus RC. Now we got to find, eh, let's just, once again, let's just skip the process of finding the current flowing towards the negative and then taking the negative of that for the feedback current. Well, let's just find the feedback current directly by finding the current in this direction. What's the current in this direction? So I is going to be the voltage here minus the voltage here divided by RA. So that's going to be um, VB times RD over RD plus RC minus VA all divided by RA. Okay, that's our current. So that's our current. That is also our feedback current. And so what's our feedback voltage? Our feedback voltage is just gonna be, I'm gonna cheat because I don't wanna redraw this. It's gonna be this times our beat. <laughs> okay, okay, great. All right, so let's clean this up a little bit, right? We could, that times RB is gonna be, uh, getting a little ugly, getting a little ugly here. That's our feedback voltage, but we're almost there. So V out is equal to the voltage of the negative terminal. Oops, plus VFB. So that's gonna be
<laughs> all right. So we're done. That's our, that's our equation for V out for the difference amplifier. I'm gonna magic a television this for you. We can play around with this equation. And if we massage this equation a little bit, we can massage it into this form here. And the cool thing about this is basically, look at what we got. We got some coefficient, right? This is just, this is just resistors here. So it's, you know, it's not the cleanest equation, but it's just a lump of resistors, resistor combination. And here, just a ratio of resistors. So we got basically some coefficient times VB minus some coefficient times VA. So we are essentially taking VB minus VA here. We're taking the difference between these two values and each one is scaled by some, by this resistor combination. But here's the other neat thing. If we choose these resistors R, A, R, B, R, C, and R, D such that this ratio equals this ratio, if we choose them so that this is true. Now keep in mind, be careful with this equation because a lot of students look at this equation and they think this must always be true. No, no, no. We're saying if we choose these resistors such that this is true, if we choose these resistors such that this is true, then our equation simplifies to this, which is beautiful. So our output voltage is VB minus VA times this ratio RB over RA. This is a wonderful, a wonderfully simple equation now made possible by choosing resistors such that these ratios were the same. And it's very easy to see now. This is a difference amplifier. We're taking VB minus VA. This is being able to subtract a signal, being able to subtract a voltage or a signal is an extremely powerful tool. Um, there's all sorts of times where we want to be able to subtract a signal. You know, if we have, let's say we have an analog signal going over a long wire and that wire is susceptible to all sorts of noise. Well, one of the tricks that we'll do is we'll send another wire along with it. So that other wire will pick up all the exact same noise. And then at the other end, we'll subtract the noise wire from the signal wire, and then it'll clean our signal up. And when we do that, we use basically a circuit like this. We use a different amplifier circuit to subtract the noise away from that signal that had the same noise added to it. Anyway, these show up all the time. One of the cool things I like about chapter five is chapter five is is op amps allow you to build things that do immediately, it's, it's immediately clear the power these things have. We're able to do these nifty mathematical operations. So your mind immediately starts to say, boy, think of all the stuff I could do with this. I could build a mixer, an audio mixer. I could, I could you know, multiply a really small input voltage. You know, I could take a really tiny signal from you know, you know, a voltage produced by the muscle of a cockroach or something, and I can amplify this to turn on an LED, right? You can, there's all sorts of nifty stuff you can do once you get to op amps. And when we talk about op amps too, we're starting to make the transition from analysis to design. So this whole class has basically been, here's some weird random circuit that nobody would ever actually construct, but we're going to just throw it at you to see if you know how to analyze it. And you're just analyzing it, right? You're just taking a circuit that somebody else made and you're analyzing it. And when we start to do op amps, this is when it, you can start to see, I, you could actually start to design things with these. And so your mind kind of starts to make that transition from, all right, what is this thing doing to how could I use a circuit like this to do something useful? And that's a really fun transition. And this class doesn't have a lot of really fun stuff in terms of you don't really get to build a lot of cool things. I'm going to make sure that we have an op amp lab coming up you're going to get to actually build something kind of nifty in that. But uh, this is what I like about chapter five is you can start to sense this transition of moving from analyzing to designing. And that's always been enjoyable for me. And again, this is the reason that we tend to lose so many op amps in, in, in our lab. So I uh, hope you enjoyed, enjoyed chapter five. Be sure to do the homework to get some examples of doing these with actual numbers rather than just with equations. And we can talk about it more and I will see you next time.